we're live. What's up, guys? Welcome back to our Fish the Moment live stream. Tonight, Randy and I are going to be talking about myths for spawning bass. What are things you've been told about spawning bass that are actually not true? We're going to be kind of peeling back the curtain on that and hopefully giving you the facts of what you actually should be looking for during the spawn. Randy, how's it going tonight? Looks like you had so, sound like you had a duck or something in the background there. Are you okay? I had the, uh, the volume on my phone up, but yeah, doing good, Johnny, man. I, you know, I'm not even supposed to be here tonight. We're, we were scheduled for our Smith Lake, Smith Lake Bassmaster Open, which today would have been our next to the last day of practice, but the tournament got canceled at the last minute uh, last week because of flooding conditions. And, man, I heard all type of stories about guys that were, had been down there practicing. They were there. They were on their way to the tournament, and they got this email that the tournament was canceled, but I hadn't left yet, so... Uh, but man, I spent a long time, you know, just taking every spare second I had to prepare for that tournament. I got my boat packed full of Smith Lake stuff and, uh, they canceled it until October, man. So just, oh, uh, that's keep... perfect for you too. They're going, taking away from you from the flipping fish to the live scope fish in October. I'm sure you're thrilled about that. <laughs> you know, that's, that's the whole thing about it. You see these, you see how the universe throws out these, these random, you know, events like that. And I would, I had my flip, I had like five flipping sticks red, ready with all my trick jig stuff on there. And now, like I said, it's going to be a little swim bait live scope in them in October. So I wasn't too happy about that. Oh man. Well, it'll still be all good by then. I may have convinced you to get a live scope. I know you've taken that hard stance against it, but you know, you never know. You can never say never, guys. But uh, we're not going to be talking about live scope tonight. We talked about that enough last week and also on our YouTube channels. You can check out a bunch of content about that over on Fish the Moment YouTube channel or on Randy's channel, Randy Blockett, uh, and Two of Angling with Randy Blockett. But uh, tonight we're going to be talking about spawning myths. And because last week was a lot more of a kind of uh, discussion show, maybe a little bit more of our own personal opinions on live scope. We wanted to dive back into traditional fish the moment live stream content, which is hardcore bass fishing theory and some myths about spawning bass. Spawn season is basically here for some guys if you're down in Texas or especially in Florida. And then for a lot of guys, you might not uh, even have ice off of your lakes yet. So, you know, we're going to be kind of covering. A pretty wide spectrum of guys tonight on um, you know where you're fishing, what stage of the fish you're in. But at some point within the next month, you're all going to probably be facing some spawning bass. So this should be a pretty interesting stream. So let's just jump straight into it, Randy, and start talking about the first myth about spawning bass. And that's that bass spawn when the water temperature reaches 60 degrees. This is something I heard a ton growing up. And when you ever, whenever I read Bassmaster Magazine, watch any television shows, everyone would say... <laughs> Fish for spawning bass when water temperatures are 60 degrees. That's when you should start looking for them. The problem with that is that when I started actually looking for spawning bass over the years, I started finding spawning bass sometimes when the water temperatures were 57 degrees. Other times I'd find, the, find spawning bass when the water temperatures were 67 to 70 degrees. I've even caught spawning bass in Arkansas when water temperatures were 79 degrees and it was the middle of June. Usually bass spawn in April in Arkansas. So there's a wide range of when bass spawn, and there's a lot of factors that go into it. And I kind of want to get into all those, but from your experience, Randy, what would you, what are your thoughts on that myth and kind of what your perspective on it is? You know, I think that's one of the biggest myths as far as everybody thinks that you know, when it reaches 60, this magical 60-degree mark that all the fish start spawning. And it's just like you said, that is simply not true. There are so many different factors involved with it. And, you know, it, inc it includes the species of bass because largemouth, smallmouth, and spotted bass will all spawn at different times. It, it, the, the biggest thing, in my opinion, we'll talk about later is the weather patterns leading up to that 60 degree mark. Um, it has to do with the lake fluctuations. Is the rake, lake stable? Is it falling? Is it, on the, is it rising up? And to the extent that it's rising, it has to do with the current. Uh, to a minor extent, moon phase, which we'll get into later. But there's just a ton of variables and I, I'm just like you as far as that example. I remember one uh, tournament I was practicing for at Table Rock Lake years ago. And it was mid-April. Water temperature, you know, it was around that 60-degree mark, maybe even low 60s. And there was this one cove that I they always get into. They, they always spawn in this one cove when that water gets 60. And I practiced for five or six days for this tournament. Um, it was, And I, I, I checked this cove every single day. Water temperatures, 60 degrees, 62, 63. 
and I never saw a bed. There wasn't a mm. single bed in there. And I went in there like every other day. I went in there the day before the tournament. So I checked it like, you know, four or five days in a row. And it went from having zero beds in it to like a hundred beds in it, like overnight. It's like those fish had moved in there overnight and started building beds. So even though the water temperature had been at that optimum level, there was still a factor a, mis a mysterious variable that allowed those a big group of fish to come in just at the same time and start building beds. So, man, there, you know, the, the whole concept around the spawn there, there is so many variables involved with it. And there's so many abstract terms and there's just a lot for us to talk about tonight with it. Yeah. And there's a couple of factors that kind of go into that. I want to talk about one Randy and then I'll let you take another here. The first factor for me that's the most important that I see that changes the fishing the most, if I pull up Google Earth here, you can kind of get an example, is the water fluctuation. This is something in the spring that happens a ton, and it can throw off the spawn so much. I think it really can mess up guys because not only does it throw off the spawn, it then throws off the all the other seasons. So the post-spawn, the summer, late summer, all these seasons get messed up. So if you go off of saying the bass spawn in April in your, your region of the country in general water fluctuations can delay that spawn by months which then means that the bass might spawn in may and your summer patterns don't start till july when they would normally start in maybe early june on a normal year so if we take a look at this lake here this is just an example of a lake where i can actually see the lake fluctuating very well let's just say that in normal situations you have a nice pocket here where bass will spawn when that water temperature gets around 60 degrees it might be 58 degrees it might be up to like 62 degrees but somewhere in that range and they're going to be laying their beds let's say in this area right here i'm just going to circle this little bank so you have a nice little bank where you have some beds and i'll drop a pin here as well just so we can be super clear now, in this situation, you have a really nice stretch of shallow water, let's say two to three feet of water where those fish can lay their eggs. However, let's say then a week or two before the bass spawn, let's say they're getting ready to spawn, they're prepared, and the water level's perfect, everything's great, but the week before you actually get to the lake, or before the, the fish start spawning, boom, the water drops out of the area where they're planning to spawn. Now you can see there's no water on this bank, there's no water on these laydowns, there's no place for those bass to spawn. Instead, they're going to have to pull out into the middle of this creek where the water remains. The problem then that might happen is because this lake got dropped down very quickly, you might then have some spring rains that start to raise the water level back up to normal pool. So over the course of, let's say, a two or three week period, maybe a month period, you might have the lake dropping really low and then rising back up. Now, this is a very extreme example. It might not be a 10 foot drop it might be a two or three foot drop in the water level but even a two or three foot drop is enough to leave this good spawning area high and dry the problem is in this case then is that if these bass are starting to prepare their beds and start to lay their eggs let's say right when that water temperature hits 60 degrees if they have a sense that water is going to start falling or dropping it's going to leave this area high and dry and those bass are not going to be able to continue spawning there their eggs are going to die if they do drop their eggs there and it's going to really mess them up another thing that might happen though is that instead of having let's say the water falling you might have the lake at a low pool and the water's warming up a lot but you normally have like spring rains that will fill the lake back up and instead of having the lake drop instead in the spring which is more common you have the lake rise in this case the lake rises and floods way back into these trees now, again, this is normally where these bass would be spawning. This is that maybe two to three foot range on a normal pool. But then if you get a bunch of rain, let's say five, six inches of rain, that can bring up the lake by two or three feet very quickly. Now what happens is that the places where these bass can spawn expand. And you might find that these fish can spawn way back up in these flooded trees. And this is now your new spawning ground for these bass way up in here. The problem you'll have is that if the bass start trying to lay their eggs, when that rain starts, it's going to put so much water over the top of their eggs that the sun cannot penetrate the water, it can't actually reach those eggs, and the eggs can't grow. As a result, all those eggs are going to die. So the, the issue these bass have in the spring a lot of times is if this water is fluctuating up or down, there's two things that can happen. Either the eggs get left high and dry because the water falls, 
or the eggs become too deep because that water rises and now those eggs die in both situations. As a result, a lot of times these bass will wait until that water stabilizes in the spring to spawn, regardless of water temperature. And this is the actual lake where I found them one year and the lake came up like 14 feet or something like crazy in April and the bass didn't spawn in April or May. They spawned in like the middle of June, end of June, almost into July because this water was rising and falling and fluctuating a ton throughout the whole spring and it only stabilized during the middle of June when the water temperatures were already 75, almost close to 80 degrees. So you really have to pay attention to those fluctuating water levels during that spawn and don't assume that the bass are going to spawn just because that 60 degree water temperature. A lot of times you'll still find fish in their pre-spawn locations in you know in april may june maybe out in this old little road bed here this hole in the road bed maybe there's a brush pile or something out here your standard staging areas maybe this little pond levee and they'll sit here waiting and waiting and waiting and continuing to feed up until that water stabilizes to move up to lay their eggs so that's one thing that can be a big factor I know another thing, Randy, that you probably see a lot is the hot, the large fluctuation in surface temperatures in the spring. Can you kind of talk about that where it'd be really cold in the morning and then really hot in the afternoon, those temperatures kind of fluctuate a lot? Yeah, definitely. And I, I think, you know, what you were just talking about there, Johnny, as far as the water level rising and falling and how stable it is, I personally, I think that's that's the biggest negative when it comes to spawning bass. I mean, there, I, I think a lot of those bass, just like you said, they not, not only do they, they delay their spawning until the water gets more stable, but I think a lot of them give up on it. I think mm -hmm. if the conditions aren't suitable, a lot of those bass just absorb their eggs, and that's why you have better spawns at certain, you know, and better year classes, you know, based upon that stability. But the surface temperature, like I said, that it is one. It, the surface temperature is one element because there's other things involved with that surface temperature that, I mean, you've got like, again, the time of day, the water level, you know, how much, you know, the, how much turbidity is in the water as far as from the normal clarity level. Um, there's a lot of different things coming into that, but as far as the surface temperature being a factor in that it's, it has to do more with the weather patterns leading up to that particular event, because what happens is when you have those bass start to get, start to want to spawn in every single lake across the country that under ideal conditions there's a window that those bass usually spawn in over a two to three week period with the exception of florida because the florida bass are completely on a different uh, timetable spawning wise but on most man-made lakes under normal conditions take for example table rock where i fish if the, if the conditions are normal weather patterns are normal you're going to have most of the bass spawning between like the uh maybe the early in the second week of april up until the end of april that's just going to be the big mm -hmm. spawn on there but what you have on there if you have some abnormal weather patterns come in and the weather patterns specifically uh are affected by wind as far as the lack of wind or how much wind you have those weather patterns and what they do to the surface temperature combined to me has a huge impact on if those fish are going to go ahead and spawn or if they're going to be delayed spawn. I mean, there's just a lot of factors going into that. But when you, when you're talking about the surface temperature, you know, under normal conditions, the moon phase may have a big part in it, but it's, to me, it's more about those fronts that come in during the prime period the prime, you know, time that they're going to spawn. And one of the biggest things that you have to have as far as water temperature and how it relates to the fish spawning is you need, a lack of wind or no wind mm. the 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 lack of wind or the lack of any presence of wind where you have those slick days on the surface the water temperatures will fluctuate greatly based upon you know the amount of wind hitting the bank how cool it's getting at night how warm it's getting in the afternoon so there's a lot of factors that combine that uh you know determine you know how much water temperature actually plays into it and what the surface temperatures do Surface temperatures, we talked a little bit about this the last couple of weeks ago. When you're talking about surface temperatures in relationship to spawning bass, don't go out there. Say, say if you're out there, like, say if you're in an area of the country, like right now, that's a little bit north of, like, the middle part of the country, and you're still in those mid-50 degree uh, temperatures, and then all of a sudden, say you guys go out on a nice day, say it's 75 degrees out, like an abnormally warm day, 
you go to the back of the cove and you see, oh man, it's 62, the water's 62 degrees. These bass are going to be spawning. Don't get sucked into that because that's a fake water temperature. The, the water temperatures when you're talking about surface temperatures and spawning is when you launch your boat on the main lake or wherever, if that water temperature is 60, 62 degrees, at seven o'clock in the morning when you put your boat in there, that's the big indication on surface water temperature that you're going to know a big population of those fish are going to be moving shallow to spawn. For sure. Those all really, really good points. And there's, there's so much goes into it. We're going to keep talking about, you know, fronts, different things like that throughout the stream. Uh, one thing that I wanted to comment on Randy, we got to comment on was that on that last example, I was given examples of these huge water fluctuations, five, 10 feet. A uh, question from Steve. He asks, what about when you have like a five or 10 inch drop from normal water level? That still has a big impact guys on the water or on the fish's spawn. It just, it won't delay it by months. The, I gave a very extreme example, but it may delay the spawn by a week or two. So you might find the water temperatures are still 60 Six, sixty-seven, sixty-eight degrees, and the bass haven't spawned yet. A lot of times, what's happening there is that, for example, this is the Arkansas River, and a lot of places where these fish spawn will be back in these little backwater ponds. You have to kind of sneak into these sketchy little areas. And normally, when the water's up here, real nice and um, and and it's flooded up, there's plenty of shallow cover, harder bottom areas for those bass to spawn in. But when that water drops out a little bit, you can see it goes from being a little bit up to a little bit further down. It's not a ton. It's just a slight drop in water level, just maybe a, a foot to, you know, 12 inches to 10, 8 to 10 inches, 12 inches of um, water drop. That's enough to get those fish to pull out here in the middle of these pockets and just hang out here until that water stabilizes. They're fine spawning if the water here is stable at this level for a week or for five or six days. Another question was, how do these fish know if there is, um, you know, how do they know the water's falling out? And my only thing to think about that is like, w w could you tell if your ceiling was getting a foot shorter on your house every single day or over the course of a little bit, you would kind of feel that water falling. And at the same time, you're also going to know based on the amount of rain that you're getting, these fish can feel the fronts, they can feel the weather changes, and they can tell, hey, this is about to rain. So if it's about to rain, they know, okay, if a front's rolling through, I'm going to hold off spawning for a day or two because there might be a big influx of rain, which then raises up that water, and it's going to change where I can spawn. So they won't spawn like right before a big front or really commit. Now those fish you have, who have already committed to the beds, they'll stay up there and spawn until they're absolutely forced to get off the beds. But I'm talking about are the fish that haven't committed yet. They're still just kind of waiting around, waiting to actually make their beds. Another thing that influences this too, guys, with this, in addition to just the water uh, levels, is the water clarity, like Randy kind of mentioned. One thing you'll see on the Arkansas River here is you have very dirty water. This means that light doesn't penetrate very deep, and you might only have let's say two to five feet of light penetration into the water. What this means is that as the water falls, there's very little room for, or margin for error for these fish when they make their beds. They basically have to make their beds in a foot to maybe three feet of water to get good light for their eggs. So if that water drops a foot, now they're getting to uh, pretty close to where those, e those eggs might be out of the water. So the dirtier the water, the smaller water fluctuations will have a lot bigger impact. On the other hand, if we're over here on like Table Rock Lake, for example, the water down by the dam is sometimes 15 feet of visibility. Well, in this case, a lot of these bass will spawn deeper as a result. They'll spawn out here in 15 feet of water way off the bank. Or if you're in the back of a cove, they'll spawn in the middle of the coves in 8 to 15 feet of water. This way, if the water fluctuates up or down, the water's clear enough that the eggs will still get sunlight even in 15 feet of water or if the water drops by 5 feet. So a lot of your spawning bass on Table Rock in the clear end of the lake are spawning in that 7 to 12 foot range a lot of times, which make them a little bit tough to catch, but it also uh, protects the bass from fishermen as well. Would you agree with that, Randy? Yeah, absolutely, man. I got I got one story here before I get into this next part here. Uh, you know, back when I was fishing uh, Bassmasters, Aaron and Mar Aaron Martins and I camped together. We both had campers, so we, we camped together and we worked together in the tournaments a little bit. And Aaron was always telling me, I don't care if we were out there and the water was 45 degrees or if it was 80 degrees, he'd, he'd, he'd tell me, man, they're spawning. And I said, man, they're not spawning. The water temperature is 47 degrees. He goes, man, I'm telling you, they're spawning. 
or we'd be in July and he goes, man, hey, I can tell by the way these fish are biting, they're spawning. And so he would, he would have this unbelievable wide range of conditions that he thinks bass spawn in. And I got thinking about it because, and you guys may have done some of this. How many of you guys have caught like a bass that was like two inches long or three inches long, like in October or November, you know, that okay if you got a two inch long bass and it's the end of october or november when was that bass spawned out i mean it had to spawn out sometime during the summertime and then you've got some oddball size when you may have some a bass that's like eight inches long or so so that fish had to spawn maybe super early so i think there's a i think there's even a wider range of of scenarios that those fish spawn in that we don't even know i mean we really don't but you know, one of the things we'll bring up here a little bit here is, uh, you know, what Johnny was saying about the fish spawning at different depths. I mean, this all has to do with bank angle and water clarity, like Johnny said. Let me share my screen here. I'll give you guys an example of um, what I'm talking about. I'm always doing that. Just answering one question here. Just to make sure. Yeah, there we go. Uh, one question from Matt. He says the TVA systems right now are flooded um, they were basically winter pool four feet low to seven feet above summer pool. So there's like an 11 foot swing in the water levels in the TVA lakes. That's the Tennessee Valley Authority lakes. Will the fish still come up to spawn or will they abandon the spawn until the lake stabilizes? A lot of those fish are not going to spawn until that lake stabilizes again. You know, it'll have to drop probably unless it stays seven feet high, which I know it won't because they're going to regulate it. Until that water level gets back to a regular pool for a week or two, or maybe like 10, 10 days, 5 to 10 days, something like that, a lot of those bass are not going to go back to commit to the beds because they know that that lake is going to drop down. They, know, they have a sense, I feel like, when that pool is normal. So they're going to hold off. So you can still catch pre-spawn bass probably f until that water stabilizes. Go ahead, Randy. Okay, here, here's an example, guys, what I'm talking about. This is, this is a cove on Beaver Lake, on the lower end of the lake. And you're going to have, in this area, you're going to have super clear water. You're going to have, you know, maybe 8 to 10 foot of visibility based upon the conditions here. And this is just, this is just a small creek arm here. And here's just a cove off the main creek. You know, on, on a deal like this, you're going to have some fairly steep, rocky banks on both sides leading where it's going to flat, flatten out in the back. Now, one of the things you got to realize when the fish are in their full blown spawning mood, say water temperature 65 degrees, last part of April, you're seeing beds around. In the cove like this, you're going to have bass in a clear water situation, like Johnny was saying, you're going to have bass spawning through this entire cove. You're, you may have some smallmouth spawning out here in 10 foot of water. You may have some Kentuckys on the big ledge rock out here in, you know, seven, eight, nine foot of water. And uh, then you may have some. 13, 14 inch largemouth in the real shallow water, like in two or three feet of water in the back end of here. So when you have a clear water lake, like Johnny was saying, you got a lot of different variables as far as where those fish are going to spawn at. Whereas say, for example, if this was a cove on Lake Eufaula in Alabama, and you were back in this cove here and Alabama and Lake Eufaula is super shallow and you've got gator grass, say in the back here, and then you don't have much cover along here, Water visibility is 10, 12 inches in visibility. You're not going to have hardly any bass spawning in here. They're going to be back spawning on the inside part of this gator grass, you know, since it's primary, primarily a largemouth uh, area. So the angle of the bank, the water clarity, and the species, which we'll talk about a little bit later, have a huge, uh, it has a, it's a huge deciding factor in the depth that those fish are going to spawn and the location they'll spawn within each cove or creek. What's the deepest you've caught a spawning bass before, Randy, or at least hypothesized that it was a spawning bass? The, the the deepest I've ever caught a spawning bass in was in 15 feet at Lake Champlain. I know I know that fish was in 15 feet because I could see the bottom of 15 feet of water, and I could see the smallmouth bedding on a big rock in 15 feet, and I pitched my tube down there and caught it. So, again, it has everything to do with water clarity and species. Smallmouth spawn really deep. I mean. That's why, if you guys think about it, think how many, think how rare it is to see a smallmouth on a bed unless you're fishing up north, like in, you know, in, in some of the real clear water northern smallmouth lakes. If you're on a lake that has a mixed species, largemouth spotted bass, smallmouth, it's very rare to see a smallmouth on a bed. I mean, I fished Table Rock Lake my whole life, and I can count on one hand how many smallmouth I've seen on the bed there. They just... 
they bed so deep and they bed in areas that you don't think those fish are going to be in that most of the time uh, you don't see them in there. But like I said, bass bed, bed deeper than what most people think. And we'll talk about it later, bass bed in areas that most people think they'd never bed in too. For sure. If you could stop sharing the screen there, Randy, just so we can see us both big again, that'll lead us perfectly into the second myth about spawning bass. Second myth is that you need to sight fish for spawning bass. And that basically you're going to be able to see all of your bass that are spawning. You're going to be able to just drive down the bank, look at the shoreline and see these bass on their beds. That is by far one of the most common misconceptions. And I think one of the reasons a lot of guys get in trouble during the spawn is that they are so focused on trying to sight fish during the spawn and actually look at the fish. I cannot tell you how many uh, times I've done really well fishing days or back when I used to fish tournaments and tournaments, fishing for sight, fishing for spawning fish that I could not visibly see, basically blind fishing for the sight fish. I knew, or for the spawning fish, sorry. Um, I even get it mixed up. I call sight fish, spawning fish the same thing because it seems so synonymous. But 95% of the spawn fishing I do is trying to target bass that I can't visibly see, but that I know are on the bed. So to give you an example of what I mean by this, there's several examples I could give. Uh, first example, let's say we go back into Table Rock Lake. If you're on Table Rock Lake, there's a couple of places where you can catch these fish without actually seeing them. The first is, let's say, in the clear water section here down by the dam. Again, you have 10 to 15 foot of visibility at times. And a lot of places where you can find these bass spawning in the, pre or in the spawn are on these flat, Gr rounded gradual points just really gradual points they're rounded like this a lot of times they're even more out in the main lake but these just gradual points that are rounded like this and they drop off into a little bit deeper water off the end but they're not really that steep i'll pull up navionic just to give you guys an example of exactly what i'm talking about let me switch this over here so here's an example of kind of these points i'm talking about these really gradual rounded points that might only be a foot of water up on the point, and then they extend out pretty far. And these smallmouth and spotted bass times on table rock will spawn really deep, like Randy talked about. And I'll drag a bait like a Ned Rig or a tube out off these points and catch a ton of fish during the spawn, not looking for the fish actually. Like you can use different rigs and stuff to potentially see them, but I find it's just more effective just to get on points like this, just drag around a three inch tube on a with a jig head in it and just slowly drag that thing across these points and you can catch some really good ones doing that. Another way you can blind sight fish that I do a lot is you can go up into, or I used to do a lot, I haven't done it recently because I haven't really been fishing shallow that much, but you can go back up into the muddy water on any lake where you have, let's say, a foot, maybe 18 inches of visibility at the most, and you can get on these banks basically that are a little bit steeper, these steeper banks that have a little bit of rock on them, uh, maybe like leading into some of these pockets, and just blind flip down these banks. A lot of times if you can get in back of a little pocket or a cove too, like a little creek in here, and find the last channel swing bank leading into the back of this creek, like right in here, just take a creature bait and just flip down this bank and flip every inch as slow as possible. I'm not showing my screen, Randy. Uh, people are probably like, what is he talking about? Here we go. Um, got this right here. This uh, So you go back in the dirty water um, back in here, and then you go to these last little channel swing banks right here where you have... A little bit of rock it's really really flat but you have just a little bit deeper water right in the back of these pockets and you can flip in that dirty water and a lot of bass will bed right in these areas and you just slowly drag your bait back to the boat the last place that you can catch a lot of fish during the spawn that a lot of guys don't fish and I'm gonna go back over here to this lake I was showing earlier is back in the back of big open flats and if we take a look at this area here you have a nice area that has let's say two foot of water visibility maybe two and a half feet of water visibility and it looks just like a big pocket but if we take the lake down what you'll see is that there's actually going to be isolated stumps and i'll make some videos about this during this this um the spawning times for you guys to show you how this works but basically you find these little stumps out in the middle of these giant flats and you can get in areas like this like this is a perfect example i've caught so many fish off these stumps during the spawn on this lake out here in the middle of nowhere and if you actually take this 
these pins, and like let's say we drop them on a couple of these stumps out here, these stumps are no more than three to four feet of water, but the water is so dirty back in here, it's only a foot and a half, two foot visibility, you can't see the stumps visibly, and when the lake is at normal pool, they're out here in the middle of the lake. I mean, I'm literally, if you if you pull this out in yards off the bank, I'm 35 yards off the bank catching spawning fish. And I'm basically just dropping waypoints like this, transferring over to uh, my fish finder. And I have a YouTube video on there if you guys want to check that out. It's uh, just type in fish at the moment, Google Earth. You'll be able to see how I do this, drop the pins and transfer them to my fish finder. But you can catch fish just marking these. And now with like, you know, 360 imaging and stuff, you can see the stumps easily and flip a little wacky worm to them or a little creature bait, maybe throw a square bill crankbait on them. And I have caught so many fish when all the other anglers in the lake were going around fishing down the shoreline and I'm blind sight fishing out here, basically casting at areas where these bass are going to spawn. The reason they're spawning here is because basically you have a muddy bottom here, this silty bottom, and these stumps are the only hard bottom where they can actually form a bed easily with the exception of maybe some rocky stuff like over here. And you can catch some fish. Actually, I've caught some off of this during the spawn, even this little rocky patch on this flat. So this is the type of stuff I look for a lot, guys, that's very sneaky. And even if you get way back in here, you can find fish spawning way off the bank as long as it's shallow enough water and it's a flat enough pocket. So that's kind of how I do it. I know you also do a lot of blind sight fishing, Randy. Can you kind of uh, explain a little bit um, w what you do there as well? Yeah, I, Johnny, there's several guys on here that said they couldn't see the screen there you put up there. I didn't know. If, if yeah, I, I fixed it. I I was okay. I got it fixed. Okay. But, uh, yeah, guys, I'll um, let me share my screen. I'll sort of show you what I look for in that situation here. I, you know, as far as this whole spawning deal here, I I've never I'm I'm sort of <laughs> like uh, anti spawn fishing, especially like in, in tournament situations. And I, I've gotten arguments with guys before that loved to bed fish before about the whole ethics part of it. But, and the argument they use, which I'll talk about here, is they say, well, Randy, you know, just because you can't see them doesn't mean you're not fishing for bed and fish. And while, yeah, I'll give that to them, it's, I just, there's, to me, there's a difference between looking at one and throwing it in, in there on it and blind pitching. But I'm going to take you guys over to Grand Lake here. And this is a shallow bay off the main lake here at Grand Lake. And uh, this particular bay right here, as you can see it, you can't see here, but this uh, this area's got a lot of lay down wood on it. It's got a lot of shallow willow trees, bushes, both live willows and dead willows. And <clears throat> say, for example, if I'm down here, <clears throat> excuse me, water temperature 65 degrees, third week of April, um, and you know the fish are spawning. There's a lot of fish, maybe fishing that you can actually see down the lake. But in this dirtier water here in the in the mid lake area, you can't see down, but maybe 12 inches deep. When you're going in an area like this, like a flat pocket that's got shallow cover, I don't care whether it's docks, whether it's lay downs, shallow grass, willows, whatever like that. When you're pitching targets in areas like areas like this that have hard bottoms, um, most of the bass that you're catching in there are they're either cruising, they're bedding or they're garden fry. They're in some stage of the spawn in, in, in areas like that. And uh, it just goes to show you that in in a dirty water, in off-colored water, those fish are not going to set up in the same type of cover that they will in, in a little bit clear water. You know, I have caught bass I know that were bedding because I've seen, you know, their bloody tails and everything just pitching on bare banks in between cover. So when you're talking about dirty water, versus clear water, most of the time when you're, the, the bass in clear water, most of the time are going to bed around some object. If you notice, if you're fishing visibility over five foot, they're normally next to a log, they're next to a stump, they're next to a little bit larger rock. They're very seldom just on a bare, sandy, gravelly type bank. But if you're in dirty water, like here in this example here, water visibility, you know, 12 inches, 15 inches, something like that, those fish are going to bed just on bare areas. So it's not like you have to flip into the heart of a piece of cover to catch them. One other thing about that is if you have a lake that is a little bit high and you've got flooded cover like bushes or trees or something like that, and you know that those fish are close to spawning and you've got, uh, you know, hard bottoms on that shallow cover, these fish will bed around the base of those bushes a lot of times, especially if the water, you know, level is in, the water depth is under three feet. 
So one of the things you want to look for in this particular situation is look for look for those pieces of cover or those flooded pieces of bushes that aren't real tight. You want to you want them a little bit sparser because they don't want to build a bed in something like a real thick bush. They're going to be off to the side on a little bit sparser bush or next to it. And that's why some of the best tournaments I've ever had flipping when I know the fish are spawning, I don't flip into the thick cover like you think you should be flipping on. You, you flip on the outside edge and those fish are bedding around the bushes. Uh, I remember we fished the tournament, Lake Travis, a uh, FLW tournament several years ago. And water was up in the bushes. Fish were close to spawning or spawning. And I'd been catching them pretty decent flipping bushes, flooded bushes, uh, you know, with a brush hog in practice. And the first day of the tournament, I was catching a few, but not too many. It was tough. I wasn't I wasn't getting near the bites that I thought I would get. And my partner out of the back of the boat, um, he put on a uh, Z hog with a half ounce weight. And he just started, he wasn't a very good pitcher. He's just, he's like, he was one of those guys that when he pitched, he looked real awkward. Like he didn't, like the lure would splash in the water and he pitched 10 feet out there and it, the line would go 10 feet in the air and hit. So he didn't really know how to pitch. So he couldn't get it in the bush. And he was just pitching to the edge of the bush simply because he he was trying to get in the bush, but he couldn't make it. And he caught like two five pounders and a three and a half and lost another good one. And those fish were they had, they were bedding on the outside part of the bushes. Water visibility again, 12 inches. So when you're fishing around cover, I don't care what type of cover it is, don't think in terms of penetrating that cover in the springtime. Think it to terms of fishing in and around that in, and in between the cover. And those are the type of just, uh, you know, bed and fish you're going to catch without seeing them. Good deal. Yeah, that's awesome stuff. And if you could stop sharing your screen here, Randy. Um, one thing I wanted, I just remembered a story too, or a good lesson that uh, I had learned while I was fishing as a co-angler in the Mr. Bass series, which is a trail if you're from Central Arkansas, you know about Mr. Bass. Now I was fishing as a co-angler, and I was fishing with one of the old timers down there who was really good. And it was kind of during the spawn on Lake Washita. And someone, the reason I uh, remember the story, shout out to Matt who said that uh, he'll fish the spawn on humps that aren't connected to the bank. And this is one of the spots where we caught him when I was like 14 years old, and this stuck with me after that for a long time. We were catching him off of this hump right here, out in the middle of the lake. And there's a bunch of standing timber and stuff out here, but there's grass also that usually grows out here. And this little hump had kind of holes in the grass. And we were catching them, or he was catching them, by basically throwing a Carolina rig with a lizard over these areas, just fishing as slow as possible. And I didn't understand what was going on, so I was throwing chatter baits and, you know, uh, spinner baits, jerk baits, trying to cover water, maybe throwing a jig around. And he was hammering them, and I didn't understand what was going on. And he finally told me near the end of the day what was going on. And he's like, they're spawning on this hump. And there were guys all in these pockets chasing around all this stuff, and he whooped them that day, caught a ton of fish, and he kicked everyone's butt in this area. And what's happening, and what he explained to me is basically that back in this pocket in here, what you'll find is that a lot of those bass that can see the boat get really skittish, and you might spend 45 minutes sometimes fishing them. You have to, they, they know you're there when they can see, when you can see them, they can see you. And so you have to really work those fish, make a lot of casts, really aggravate them to get them to bite. These fish that are out here in the middle of the lake, this is obviously when the lake is drawn down, but a lot of times this lake is higher, and so the hump is right here. And so you, normally this might be in two, three, four, five feet of water, but then, obviously, when the lake's down, you can see it. And the bass will spawn out here, out here in this shallower water. And those fish hardly ever get fish for. And also, you can stay further away from them. Fire bait, like a Carolina rig up there. You could throw a little Ned rig or shaky head, a bunch of stuff. Drag it real slow. And you're going to be able to get those fish to bite a lot quicker. Basically, putting that bait around their area will cause them to bite because they're not boat shy. And they're a lot easier to catch. And that's the same thing with a lot of these blind sight fish that I talked about earlier on, like those stumps on the flat. The the less or the further away you are from those fish and the less chance you give them to see your boat, the better chance those fish will bite within one or two casts in area. And a lot of times I'll make multiple presentations to the same stump or the same spot in the grass, make five, six casts there. But it only takes maybe, you know, maybe five or six casts at most to get those fish to commit versus 75 flips onto a bed when those fish know you're there. So that's something that I learned a long time ago. Uh, anything to add there, Andy? 
Yeah, I'm, that's just another one of the things I can sit here and give you guys examples that just, you know, that just go against the grain like you, like you can't imagine. Let me give you guys one here. I'll, I'll give you guys one pertinent to that here. Um, I'm going to take you guys over to Lake Pickwick and tell you guys a little story about this. Do you see my screen there, Johnny? Yep, I got you. Okay, guys, this was back, um, it was probably the mid-90s, Lake Pickwick. And you got to remember, this was before GPS. It, it was before 2D sonar. All it was was flashers. I drew this old man out. It was a Bassmaster tournament, the first time we'd ever fished Pickwick before. And I drew this old man out that was, uh, you know, he, God, he was probably in his 70s or so when I drew him out. And it was a draw. It was a, no, it was a pro-am. It was a, it was a Bassmaster Top 150. And this guy was a co-angler. But when I drew him out, all these, everybody that I, you know, talk to, you said, man, you just got the best local on the lake. This guy has fished the lake since before it was impounded. So anyway, I get out with the guy and obviously I didn't know much about the lake and he knew everything about it. We get out there and he's, and back then you could get information for your co-angler. I didn't have anything going. So I said, man, if you got something going, let's just go to your fish. So he took me out. This was an April tournament. Fish were starting to bed. And he took me out here. I'll show you guys where it was on Pickwick. Here's the main. Here's the main lake at Pickwick here, Main River Channel. And he took me out to this hump right here. This is in the middle of the lake. And he told me there was a bunch of big smallmouth spawning on this hump out here. And I'm like, yeah, right. You know, there's current. We're in the middle of the lake. And I'm I'm just from Missouri, so I don't know anything about spawning river smallmouth. So he takes me out to this hump here. Wait, I'm talking. We're in the middle of the lake here. And he takes a white grub with a eight pound test yellow fluorescent line on a spinning rod. And he starts firing it out in this hump out of the back of the boat. First cast, he catches one, he, or he hooks one, biggest smallmouth I've ever seen. The thing comes up and jumps. It's like a seven pounder and jumps off. And he, it didn't even phase him. He just like said, oh, we'll get plenty of those today. He wound up catching, I can't remember what it was. He had like four fish that weighed 18 or 19 pounds that day. He wound up winning the tournament, the co-angler side, and he caught more weight out of the back of the boat than any pro did that won the tournament. And every pro went to his fish. But what he told me is he, those, he said these big smallmouth will spawn out on the main river channel in seven to 10 foot of water, even if it's current, if you've got shells or hard bottom. And that just goes against everything that I've ever read or heard about spawning bass. So this is just a prime example I wanted to share with you guys about there's the whole spawning topic is wide open, you know, and there's just, I, I think everybody can give us situations that go against the, what they should be doing or something like that. But this is just one situation that stands out to me about big spawn, spawn and smallmouth on TVA lakes. Randy, it sounds like the secret to become a good fisherman is to sign up for tournaments and then make sure you draw a really old guy. And well, if you don't, you need to tra trade co-anglers with people. That's how you got to learn to fish because it's worked for you and it worked for me. I'm telling you guys, okay, you got to remember this. Look, it's, it's We're out in the middle of Pickwick and there's, there's no GPS. There's nothing. This guy shut down. He told me to shut down. He lined up everything perfect on the bank. And we shut down right on this spot with nothing other than a old hummingbird super 60 flasher. Wow. No, I mean, nothing else by that. Now that is a, a real grizzled fisherman right there. Oh yeah. That's, that's awesome. That's really, really cool. Cool. Well, um, there's a bunch of questions I want to answer. So many, you guys are leaving great questions. Keep them coming on the live stream chat. Just type in at fish the moment if you can, or at fish the moment live. Um, and we can um, answer those questions for you. Um, let's see here. Let's. Uh, one thing I want to talk about really quick, Randy. Obviously, you guys know that uh, we got the live stream, and uh, we need to monetize the live stream somehow. We don't do sponsors. The way that we do it is through our website over at fishmoment.com. So if you guys have appreciated the information we're giving and uh, would like to help support the channel, one thing you can do is head over to fishmoment.com. We have uh, some upcoming virtual seminars you can check out, which are basically like these live streams, except for we have really, really detailed presentations. We share a lot of secrets that we do not talk about on the live streams, in YouTube videos. We save the best juice for these seminars. Again, we spend probably anywhere from 10 to 15 hours putting together slides, shows, and really detailed graphics for you. 
first seminar up here is the Advanced Electronics Seminar. There's literally one spot left in this whole seminar, and that's the only that's the only spot we have open. So if you guys are interested in this, go sign up for the Advanced Electronics Seminar. I've talked about that a lot recently, so not going to spend a ton of time there. Another one we have coming up is our Post-Spawn Tournament Pattern Seminar, where Randy and I are going to share our top secret post-spawn patterns. There's, the post-spawns are a really crazy time of the year to fish, so we're going to kind of cover everything from post-spawn, offshore, shallow, clear water, dirty water, smallmouth, spotted bass, largemouth, all on man-made lakes. So if you fish man-made lakes, this is the seminar for you. If you have some tournaments coming up or just want to get better at catching big fish in the post-spawn. Also, check out some of our lake breakdowns if you guys are interested in getting some waypoints on your local lakes to help speed up your learning process. Randy breaks down lakes and gives you 40 GPS waypoints with detailed area descriptions and keys to how to fish the lake, as well as instructions on how to download these waypoints onto your fish finder. And we have lakes from all across the country, broken up by season. You got spring breakdowns, winter breakdowns fall breakdowns and summer breakdowns are coming here soon. And you can also always pick up a personally breakdown. We restock every Monday. And for all our Patreon members, I just left you guys a message if you're on Patreon that we're actually opening up a, se- a separate personal lake breakdown page for Patreon members because these sell out within like an hour of being posted every Monday. So we gave uh, you guys a little bit better chance where there's two available each week just to Patreon members if you guys are interested in that. So that's it for that, Randy. Um, want to jump in and answer some questions here, but anything else to add about any of those seminars or any of the breakdowns? Yeah, that post-spawn seminar Johnny and I are doing on the 15th is going to be a really good one because I'm sure Johnny's going to share a bunch of football jig offshore secrets for the post-spawn. And the post spawn for me is one of the favorite time of years. I like to power fish shallow. I mean, you can catch good ones doing both. So that's going to be a lot of good juicy info in that one. Yeah. Awesome. I completely agree with that. So uh, let's, uh, one question that I really wanted to answer was from Artie. Uh, Artie basically says, how do you pattern, uh, or what was the question? He says, um, oh yeah. What do you do when you don't catch bass uh, or don't catch fish where they're supposed to be? Do you return with different bait? I fish where they're supposed to be all the time and blank a lot. That is a really great question, Artie. Honestly, I feel like that's a question that a lot of guys, or something a lot of guys get wrong when they go to the lake. And what I see is one of the most common mistakes that newer anglers make is that they watch a YouTube video. For example, one of my YouTube videos about where to catch fish in the pre-spawn. And I might show a map of Table Rock Lake and I'll say, okay, great place to catch fish in the pre-spawn are the secondary points Rounded secondary points, and you can catch them on a jerk bait. And the water temperature is between 48 and 55 degrees. So they go there, they go to the back of these pockets, 48 to 55 degree water temperatures, and they're throwing a jerk bait, and they can't catch a fish to save their life. And they've tried every secondary point in the entire lake. Why are you not getting bit? Well, most of the time when Randy and I go out to the lake, we're not just going to fish one pattern or fish one specific area. We, Randy and I don't fish areas when we go to the lake. We fish the conditions and we fish, fish the moment. We fish where the fish are. And really, like for example, on Table Rock in the pre-spawn, there's a potential that at any given time, depending on what the water level's been like, the um, current flow, the pre-front conditions, post-front conditions, all these factors, you might find in the same creek you catch them six different ways. Maybe, for example, if it's really cold and those water temperatures haven't warmed quite up yet, they're like 48 degrees and they're kind of hanging cold, these fish might be out in the middle of this pocket and you have to catch them video game fishing with a Demiki rig and a jigging spoon. And then maybe... And a different time, let's say that water has got a lot of rain and it's muddying up. Well, maybe instead of being out here in the middle of this pocket, they're up here and you can catch them on a rock crawler crankbait fishing 45 degree chunk rock banks. Or then maybe it's a bright sunny day and those fish are set up on these secondary points. Or maybe they're somewhere doing something completely different. There's so many patterns that go on that are dictated by weather conditions, time of day, current flow, all these different things. So... One thing I can recommend already to you is don't get stuck on trying to fish where the fish are supposed to be. Instead, try to just fish as many different types of areas and styles, and don't worry so much about your bait selection. Focus on trying to fish the different stages where the fish are going to be. Fish the winter stage, the pre-spawn stage, the post-spawn stage. If you guys are curious on all this stuff, I do offer a seasonal bass movement seminar. This is going to be coming up in May next month, or I guess almost next month. But in May, I do a seasonal bass movement seminar that talks about how these bass move throughout the seasons and also how all of the different weather changes will affect 
the seasonal movements it'll affect when the fish spawn when they don't summer patterns all this stuff so check out that seminar too it's gonna be next month um you can keep i'll if you watch the live stream you guys will see it but basically just keep an open mind that's the only thing i can say there already you can't get locked in on doing what the fish are supposed to be doing you have to try a little bit of everything until you get a first bite and get dialed in what do you think about that randy i have asked myself that exact same question so that's an excellent question man I don't know how many times I've been out there and, you know, you've had a solid practice. Everything's going great. Um, and then the tournament rolls around. And I know you guys, if you guys have fished tournaments, I can promise you what I'm going to tell you right here. You thought the same thing. 10, 30, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock rolls around and you go to yourself. I don't know why these fish aren't biting. Where'd they go to? What happened? I, I just can't believe they're not biting. We have all said that. And it's just like Johnny said, the whole key about it is you have got to fish the conditions. You've got to fish the hour by hour, the fish change. Don't get locked into anything that didn't work before. If you're in an area, for example, say say you're fishing, uh, say it's the, it's the second week of March and you're fishing secondary points in a main creek. I guarantee there's bass on those secondary points. Every fish on that, I mean, every secondary point in a big creek in mid, the middle of March has got bass on it. A lot of times you just have to adjust your tactics and techniques. If you're doing something, you've been catching them a certain way, you may have to make an adjustment in bait profile, bait color, retrieve. So just if they're not biting, if you go for 15 or 20 minutes without biting, uh, switch it up a little bit. And then eventually you have to make the determination, you need to change your technique or do you need to change your area? And that's the that's the $64,000 question we all ask ourselves is, do I need to change bait or I need to move and get out of here? So don't beat yourself up on that question. Cause I, I have the same question myself and I've been doing this a long time. Yep, for sure. There's, there's so many days when Randy and I both go out and we've, we've gone fishing on the same day before and we both come in scratching our head. Like what was going on? I was fishing offshore. Randy was fishing shallow. It's just, sometimes it's just tough days too. Uh, overall, we've seen that happen. You can see that on, for example, Major League Fishing Tour, that, that Sam Rayburn event. Sam Rayburn in March, Randy, you would think they would be chewing, and like half the guys barely caught a fish, or they maybe caught two or three fish all day. And these are guys that practice, they fish Sam Rayburn, and these are the best anglers in the world. And they're struggling to catch two fish a day on Sam Rayburn in the middle of March. Crazy stuff. Yeah. It happens to everybody, man. There, it's just I don't care who you are. You're going to have your good days and your bad days on the water. It's just those bad days make you really appreciate the good ones out there. <laughs> For sure, awesome. So uh, next uh, myth we want to break down and kind of keep it on topic here. Next one is that all bass spawn at the same time. We've addressed this a little bit, but this is something that I think a lot of guys don't understand because. I feel like they think the spawn is just something where all the bass just, for whatever reason, just light switch comes on and all the bass start spawning immediately. This is not true at all, uh, not even close. There's usually going to be anywhere from three to five waves of fish that spawn within a certain section of the lake, and then different fish spawn at different times throughout other sections of the lake as well. So let me kind of explain that. First off, for example, let's pull up Lake Washita here. This is a pretty big lake. Um, if we take a look over here, you have down by the dam, very clear water, 8 to 10 foot of visibility, super clear. And then if we go up some of the river arms, you might get a foot to 6 inches of visibility. What you'll find first and foremost is that within any of these sections of the lake, so up this creek arm or over in this creek arm, there's going to be two or three waves of bass that spawn within this creek itself. So there's going to be a wave that moves in, spawns, pulls out, another wave that moves in, and a third wave that moves in. Now all the bass move up and spawn at the exact same time within the same creek. In addition to that, you'll find that bass will spawn at different times of the year in different sections of the lake. So for example, up here in the dirty water, this dirty water, as long as it's stable, is going to warm up a lot faster due to all the silt in the water. It'll warm up quicker. And you might find that your water temperatures are 68 to 70 degrees sometimes up this part of the creek when water temperatures are still in the high 50s down in the clear end of the lake. So you can have a 10 to 15 degree water temperature difference. In addition to that water temperature difference, there's a lot of other factors that go into when these fish spawn. But in general, you can find that up these creek arms, you could find fish spawning in the first to second week of March sometimes on Lake Washita if it's a warm uh, spring. And 
then the fish might not be spawning on this creek over here till the second or third week of April. So you're going to have a month difference between when these bass spawn up in the dirty water creek and when they spawn in the clearer water area down by the dam. This is basically going to cause a, like a bunch of different things where what you'll find is that in the mid lake section where the water is maybe in between the clear and the dirty, these fish spawn at a different time as well. So you're going to have fish spawning in March here, early April here, mid-April here, and then within that, there's going to be multiple waves of fish. So there's probably going to be bass spawning at any given week of the year, unless the water's kind of weird, from the first week of March till probably the end of May, and there's going to be a spawning bass on this lake somewhere that entire time. It's just you have to be in the right section when that's happening. Now, Lake Washita is a pretty big lake with a lot of diversity, so this is an extreme example, but just it goes to show that the spawn happens for a lot longer period of time than guys expect, and a lot of it comes down to where you are in the lake, not so much just the weather and stuff like that. Anything to add there, Randy? Yeah, definitely so. It's um, the, uh, Again, it has a lot to do with the part of the lake you're in. I'll, I'll mean, take, guys, take you to Tabor Rock, and I'll show you what I'm talking about here with this. Um, I remember I was practicing for a, uh, let's see here, for a tournament. It's been, man, 20 years ago here at Tabor Rock. And this was an April tournament, uh, mid part of April, you know, fish were bedding down the lake and I was way up the right river here. I mean, I was, the, the, here's the Beaver Lake Dam right here. I mean, I'm way up here and the water was a little bit high and I got onto a deal flipping debris mats way up the river here on the main river. So I'm actually on bluff banks, flipping debris mats, catching hogs. I mean, there was this day I was out there every bass that you caught was a big one i had never seen anything like it but these mats were like um over they were like over eight to ten foot of water so these bass were suspended under these mats big fat pre-spawn females obviously not spawning at all and i go into every one of these cuts and coves up here like this and there wouldn't be a fish on a bed anywhere in the back of these coves but like the next practice day i flip-flopped and i went all the way down to the dam which is 60 miles down there and i remember specifically i went into this bay right here by the dam and this bank right here just the main creek bank there was a bed every 10 feet all the way down to they were bedding everywhere in here so we're on complete opposite ends of the lake you have different factors that that that, that our water temperature variations, their current fluctuations, their bank angles, um, just it's a different environment, a little bit of change in water clarity. All this stuff adds up to, you know, certain parts of the lake, they're just behind others or ahead of others. And again, a lot of that has to do with, uh, you know, the conditions on the part of the lake you're in, you know, water clarity being the, probably the biggest factor with that. Yeah, for sure. It's, it's definitely one of those things. The spawn is very difficult because it fluctuates so much. And one thing I think that is really helpful is if you guys understand the spawn better, it also will help you be prepared for the pre-spawn and the post-spawn. Because even if you're not wanting to fish for bedding fish, understanding when those fish spawn will then allow you to figure out when are they post-spawn, when do they start pulling offshore, where are they going to be. And you have to kind of understand all those moving parts to really get a good grasp of bass movement and bass behavior. I do have a bunch of videos on the main Fish Moment channel if you want to check them out. I actually have a video about the five spawning myths that have a lot of good graphics and stuff over on the main Fish the Moment channel. So you can just go over there, type in Fish the Moment spawning myths, and I have a video with really detailed graphics and a little bit more concise, like 12, 13 minute video explaining all this if you want to check that out. And, you know, we also have our seminars coming up with seasonal bass movement. I'm just looking over here to see when they're scheduled. I have them all organized on my board here. So those are, you know, things that we have offered. But, um, you know, with fishing, guys, as we always say, there's a million factors that go into it. It's very hard to know exactly what's going to happen because there's all these constantly changing variables. And a lot of times it just comes down to experimentation. That's the biggest skill of any good fisherman is being able to experiment. And what we've talked about in other live streams the ability to fail fast. What that means is that you can try something for 15 minutes. If it's not working, 
give up on it and go try something else very quickly. And don't try the exact same thing. Don't go throw a wacky worm in a hundred pockets because if they're not biting a wacky worm in pockets, you're not going to catch anything. Instead, maybe throw a wacky worm in a pocket, then go throw a mag draft swim bait on a rocky main lake point, then go throw a jerk bait on a channel swing, then go throw a jig under boat docks. Try a bunch of different stuff until you get that first bite and fail fast. You're going to catch way more fish that way. Would you agree there, Randy? Yep, no doubt. I mean, it's just all about experimentation. <clears throat> One thing I'll, I'll add that I don't think we're covering tonight that I wanted to throw in real quick, and this is a, it, here's a, here's a tip, guys. It's, it's worth, I mean, it, this, this tip is worth its weight in gold as far as catching bass when the fish are spawning. I don't care if they're visible fish or non-visible fish. Is one of the biggest tips I can give you guys is go light hmm. because it's I can't stress them out stress enough how important it is when you're fishing a slow bait which is what you normally fish during the springtime of the year you know jigs creature baits wacky rigs that type of stuff you're going to get a lot more bites if you downsize the weight even not necessarily downsize the profile but downsize the weight if I'm fishing a full size jig like with a big zoom big salty chunk on it I don't ever go over a quarter ounce I, in fact I'll take a quarter ounce head and I'll file it down to an eighth ounce if I'm using a Texas rig creature bait, I've got at the most an eighth or sixteenth ounce sinker on it. The spawning bass, the personality and the mood of them, they will eat a slow falling bait when at times when they won't touch a fast falling bait. So that's just a little juicy tidbit out there. Some of you guys may have known it, but I'm telling you it's a uh, it's a huge part in, in catching them this time of year. Sure, and even like a weightless bait. It's hard to beat a weightless Senko this time of year or a wacky worm. Really, really tough, especially in clear water. Yep. Another thing I will say, guys, if for, for those who are wanting to do some spawning stuff, I'll give away one of my little secrets here, Andy. I, I have some bait modifications. I know you're the king of bait modifications on YouTube, but you know, I, I got one or two for you guys, you know. Especially shallow I don't have a lot of shallow water ones. This is like a this is very rare for me to have a good shallow water bait modification, Randy. But uh if we go to a uh, um one thing I like to do a lot this time of year, especially in that dirtier water, if when I'm blind sight fishing, guys, is or blind that doesn't make sense. Blind fishing during the uh, spawn is I'll take this four and a half inch Strike King Denny Brower Pro Flipping Tube, four and a half inch. It has a little um, solid head in the top, and I'll Texas rig that thing in a black neon color. And what I'll do with this is I will take a tube rattle. So this is like really really sneaky stuff, but take a tube rattle like this. Put it into your tube, and when you work that tube, pitch it up there and just shake that thing in place really slow against any cover. And I have fished behind hundreds of anglers before and caught big fish right behind. I mean, I would, I literally will say, like on Lake Dardanelles where I really developed this Arkansas River in the dirty water, I've caught hundreds of bass behind people in the spring just with this one bait where I will pull up on the bank right behind someone. And that's crazy because like on Lake Dardanelles and I used to fish a ton of tournaments there – I didn't even care if people were around because I was so confident with that tube plus the tube rattle in there, and I'm throwing like a 316 out slip sinker just Texas rigging it. I wouldn't, it wouldn't bother me at all if someone had just fished that bank or if six guys had just gone down that bank because I could go right behind them and fish super slow and just shake that tube with the rattle, and I knew I could catch fish right behind everyone. So that's a little sneaky deal that uh, just the Johnny special bait modification, Randy. Do, is that get your seal of approval? I will have to try that because I have never used a tube rattle before. So that, that's a good tip, man. That's a good modification. Is that a rattle you just put right in the middle of it? How does that thing affix to it? How does it, how does it attach to the tube? So you basically just take, um, you take the tube, you slide it inside the tube, and then you, like, you basically take the tube, put the rattle in there, then you Texas rig it so that the hook goes through, and that hook holds the rattle in there. It doesn't so, interfere with the, uh, hook, the hook penetration. It, like it does. You have to have the right hook. Because if you um, if you get the wrong weight with the wrong rattle, I've had that happen where you lose fish on it. But uh, it, there, you have to find the right length hook with the right – I'm not going to give it all away, Randy. You know, we'll, <laughs> we'll save that for seminars. Okay. That's, that's, uh, that's too much juice to be given. Um, <laughs> um, let's see here. So uh, – one more thing, uh, one more myth we want to talk about here really quick, guys, is um, the last myth about spawning bass is that weather patterns, or no, sorry, uh, the last myth is that the moon phase 
is the end-all be-all during the spawn. So many guys get caught up in the moon phase. And the moon phase does have an impact on the spawn. It really does. Usually when there's a full moon, they have more light. The bass can kind of gives them extra time to spawn because there's it's brighter. Um, and I feel like the moon phase can't help, but it is by... It is definitely not the most important factor. Water level fluctuations, fronts, changes in rapid changes in water clarity. Um, there's so many other factors that are more important. I would say weather pattern changes trump moon phase 100% of the time. If there's no other factors going on, everything else is stable, then the moon phase can play a factor. But you're not going to say like if the water is rising three or three inches to five inches a day, but the moon phase is perfect. Those fish aren't just going to start spawning because the moon phase is right. They're they're just not. They're, the water level fluctuation trumps the moon phase. But do you kind of have a um uh a better kind of maybe or do you have any insight on the moon phase? Because I don't really pay that much attention to the moon phase that much, really, Randy. But do you have any um, yeah. sage wisdom there? Well. Uh- Guys, I can't tell you how many times that, you know, I, I've been, I, I've, I've fished so many spawn tournaments over the past 40 years. I can't even remember all of them. I mean, I've fished tons of them. And inevitably, when, you, when you're when you at the tournament meetings or this type or you're talking to your friends, everybody says, oh, it, we're coming up on the full moon. There's going to be a big spawn or, you know, the, the moon's not right. It's not, they're not going to be spawning. That has very little effect on it. And I'll tell you guys a story here. I was at the tournament where Dean Rokos set that record of 45 pounds off bed and fish. And let me tell you the situation with that here. I'm going to do a YouTube video on this at one point. And this will sort of give you an example of what, what trumps everything over moon phase. We were at Lake Toho. It was February. Um, in practice, the weather was pretty, it, they'd been pretty cold. There was like a, you know, north wind. Uh, you know, water temperatures were in the 50s. It was sort of just nasty floor, nasty for Florida. And I was catching them pretty good on a jerk bait, you know, and pretty good at Toho was like 14, 15 pounds a day. That's a solid bag on that place because normally like back then, 12, 13, 14 pounds a day gets you in the top 10. So what happened is the last day of practice, the wind died down. Um, it got completely slick. And it turned from like 55 degrees to like 80 degrees all day long. And it was, there wasn't a breath of wind. It was 80 degrees. The entire lake was like glass. The whole last day of practice. The first day of the tournament, the same thing. It stayed really warm. We didn't have a full moon. It stayed unseasonably warm at night. Not a breath of wind. And the first day of the tournament, there wasn't a breath of wind. And it was 80 some degrees also. I went out and threw my jerk bait and I came in with, I had like 14 pounds or something like that. And I'm coming into the weigh-in area and Brent Chapman's dad walks down to me and he goes, how'd you do, Randy? I said, well, I did pretty good. I got 14 or 15 pounds. And um, I go, what's leading it? And he goes, 45 pounds. And I just laughed. I said, yeah, right. And he goes, no, 45 pounds was leading the tournament. I said, no, I said, come on, what's leading the tournament? 45 pounds. And Dean Rojas, that's when he caught the 45 pound bag. Those conditions, what happened is there wasn't a single bass on the bed. The, the moon wasn't right. There, everything, nothing was set up right. But you had a condition where you had perfect weather variables. The, the barometric pressure was light, right. The wind was right. Everything was right. And those giants moved up overnight. And there was three 40 pound plus bags of bedding fish caught in that tournament. And it didn't have anything to do with the moon phase. Mm. Yep. Yeah. Wow. That's an awesome story. I mean, that's that just goes to show. I mean, there's there's so many other factors. I mean, weather is so there's so much that goes on with weather. We just did a seminar. I did one uh, last. I guess my last seminar was how weather affects bass. It was an awesome seminar because I love talking about how weather changes go through because there's so many things you can dive into there. And For those who are always wondering uh, about the seminars, we don't post the recordings of the seminars, but I do do the most popular seminars on a rotation. So like the electronic seminar, apparently it's already full from, I mentioned it like 10 minutes ago. It's now full, um, but I rotate them every quarter so every four months i'll repeat them so we'll be doing the seasonal bass movement then we'll be doing how weather affects bass coming up here in the next couple months and we keep repeating them so if you missed them don't worry they're there um always seem to fill up really well so definitely check out those seminars if you guys are interested and for those who are who are interested in that you can always find the seminars our upcoming seminars over on 
fishthemoment.com right here. So just go to our website, fishthemoment.com, and find our virtual seminars. We have the post-spawn tournament pattern seminar here that we have coming up in the middle of April, and then, or actually the end of, yeah, middle of April, and then at the end of April, Randy, I'm going to be actually doing a seminar about um, offshore summer bass fishing secrets. That's going to be a really good one. I'm going to talk about all my secrets for catching offshore bass in the summertime. It's my favorite time of year to fish. We're going to be covering a lot of cool stuff. I'll talk about that in the next uh, live stream. But that is a literally a can't-miss seminar because I am. The, if I had to pick one time of year that I feel like I'm the best at, it's summer fishing. I've been able to fish a ton because when I was in school, even like in high school, college, we'd have the summers off and like I could, you know, if I, even if I had a job or whatever, I could work for, you know, the mornings and I could go fish at night or work in the after or work for the, you know, first half day and I'd go fish till dark. So I spent thousands of days fishing offshore in the summer. So I got some juice, Randy, that you you probably want to log into that one because I got some stuff that would blow your mind on that. So I'm excited I, I'm about that not- one. I'm not embarrassed to call myself a student of the sport, man. I'm, I'm, I'm big as a student as anyone else out there. Good deal. I mean, I learned plenty from you up shallow, so not saying that I know any more about about fishing. Just I'm, I'm really good at that one specific thing. That's one thing that guys we you always want to make sure, uh, or I want to make sure are clear about is that um, not by any means saying I'm the best fisherman in the world. Randy isn't either, but we're, we do have our specialties. We've worked on our specific skills. Like I have a very specific skill set. It's like very narrow. I don't have a very broad skill set. I'm offshore electronics. That's it. That doesn't encompass a lot of fishing. So a lot of guys, you know, always say like, Johnny, why don't you fish in tournaments? Well, I probably get my butt kicked on the pro tour in half the tournaments, because I'm not going to be able to have any confidence going up shallow catching fish. I spend so much time fishing offshore. I, I mean, I can catch them shallow just like everyone else, but like I'm not going to catch them better than probably a lot of people on the stream because I don't fish up shallow that often. But the offshore game, that's where I know. So, and that was, you know, that's the deal. Guys, fishing is the most difficult sport that there is. I'll argue that point with anybody. There, there is not another sport out there that has more variables, both controlled variables and uncontrolled variables as bass fishing. I mean, it is a complex sport. There's no, you know, there's no black and white areas. Everything's abstract in it. So nobody out there knows everything. I don't care who it is. I don't care if you're Brian Thrift or Kevin Van Dam or what everybody or anybody out there, they're just students like everybody else. You know, they, 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 they're clueless about certain things of bass behavior like anyone else is. So, you know, don't ever beat yourself up. If you guys are have, if you guys are frustrated, like you feel like your learning, you know, is going too slow of a pace, or you have frustrating days on the water, and uh, you know you come off, you know, disappointed. Don't beat yourself up because we all do. I do. Johnny does. Bam Bam does. Thrift does. We all do, man. So uh, you know, just you know, try to be kind to yourself a little bit if you have those slow days out there. Yeah, another thing that I always find interesting. I was thinking about this the other day, Randy. I know we or uh kind of off topic here but one thing i want to talk about for example is like i, I was thinking about this the other day and it was a lot of stuff with the all the live scope talk and all these different things people are saying different things on social media you know how it goes and the way i thought about it was a lot of my fishing knowledge that i've gained i understand how bass behavior works really well in relation to offshore fishing because when i was learning about how bass behavior works how bass move and change it's all in this perspective of how bass move and shift and change offshore now that still gives me a really good understanding of offshore fishing uh or of, of shallow water fishing as well but contextualizing knowledge for one type of fishing or another is very difficult so for example all the stuff i've learned about bass movement and things, I know how it applies to going and fishing an offshore hump or an offshore point or, you know, all the different offshore strategies, but then taking that same knowledge and applying it up shallow without the actual time on the water and the experience fishing up shallow is very, very difficult. Same thing goes for on your end. You probably know everything there is about bass behavior in the same way I do and more, but all of that is in relation to shallow water fishing, and it's hard to transfer that to offshore fishing. Now imagine if you aren't an expert and offshore fishing or shallow fishing and you're just getting all this info on bass behavior and everything it's great that you know all the info but you have to ground that info in some sort of experience 
on the water time actually catching fish to build confidence. And then you can connect the dots to say, oh, water level is this, water temperature is this, the wind direction is this, now I'm catching fish. And combining all that experience together, that's what makes a fisherman good. Having just the textbook knowledge of everything without the on the water experience is useless. That's why I can't, even though I know all the stuff about bass behavior, I can't go out and consistently catch them off the bank because I don't have the on the water experience doing that. I do offshore though, and that's why I'm always more successful fishing offshore, regardless of situation. Even if the fish are chewing on the bank, I probably have a better chance catching them offshore because that's where all of my knowledge is contextualized. Does that make sense to you, Randy? Yeah, absolutely, man. And and it's, you know, the thing about bass like that is like there's, I mean, there's just always more than one way to catch them. I mean, we you guys have seen it the same way. And when you're everything in this that we're talking about i I tend to compare everything in like a tournament scenario because a tournament is like it's it's a it's a pure environment to test what bass are doing because it gives you so many different aspects of it but one of the things you guys have to remember as far as like when you're talking about bass fishing this time of year tournaments or whatever that um you can't always land on the right part of the lake like Mm -hmm. when you're talking about fishing for spawning bass and say, for example, you guys got a day to practice for your club tournament or you got a day to go fishing over the weekend. You can't fish everything. You can't you don't you can't fish from one end of the lake. So you have to put together all the information that you have and try to land on that one particular area that you think is going to be the best. And in a tournament situation, sometimes you do and sometimes you don't. And, uh, you know. So that's why it's so hard to be consistent in this in this sport because you don't always land on the best area of the lake. I'll go and I'll say this about a tournament situation. A lot of the tournament anglers out there that you see that are consistent, they are consistent specifically at this time of year because they get a lot of information fed to them. They get a lot of information from the best local anglers before they go to the tournaments. You know, they're plugged in and that and it puts them in those high percentage areas a lot quicker than a lot of other people. So, you know, just remember that, you know, it's like if you're having a hard time out there this time of year, you know, it could just be that you're just in, not in the right part of the lake. And a lot of that is just hit and miss. Yeah, that, rem- that kind of brings back to that Lake of the Ozarks term you fish, Randy. You just kind of picked the wrong area of the lake day one. Day two, if you went to a different area and you caught them and if you had been there both days, you would have made a check and it's just that decision it's not that you don't know how to catch them you're just in the wrong part of the lake and that's kind of when i made this example of where these bass are positioning on um lake washita earlier again those fish can be spawning over here in march and over here in may sometimes and they're spawning fish all around and you have to play to your strengths so for example i'm not going to do nearly as well catching them up in this dirty water section of the lake when those fish are spawning. But in the pre-spawn, I might have a, sh- a shot because those fish might be a little bit further offshore or vice versa. And, you know, at the same time, there's parts of the lake sometimes where just they're just biting better. Like this mid-area of the lake, Buckville area on Washita, they might just be biting like crazy. Shallow, offshore, it doesn't matter. And that's kind of what happened in that Lake of the Ozarks tournament with you, Randy, is like that, there was one area of the lake where they were just biting. And that's where all the top... 30 guys caught him and there was very few guys in the other sections of the lake that caught him so on big lakes things like that it's really really tough maybe i want to do some experiments randy with tournament practice fishing i don't fish tournaments that much anymore because you, you know it's not really my deal but maybe we could get you to run some experiments for you for your upcoming tournaments and i'd love to kind of do some practice like strategies like how do we how do we optimize practice fishing for tournaments i think we could figure that out we're like maybe a mix of should you just run around the entire lake and sample a little bit of everything should you pick one section of the lake like i I feel like there's a way that you could optim there there has to be a way you can optimize your success in tournaments by setting up your practice in a certain way by different types of lakes i feel like that's very complicated that's probably a very in-depth experiment but uh, do you think it's possible and also let me know in the comments guys if you think that that would be interesting yeah, so much of getting on fish, I don't care if you're just fun fishing or whatever, it's getting hit by that indicator bass because you've got to you've got to catch that first fish. I don't care if it's 12 inches or 3 pounds. You've got to get that first fish in the boat to sort of get you pointed in the right direction. And sometimes you get that bite and sometimes you don't. So that that's just, you know, the, the way that you wind up fishing these lakes, whether it be your technique or the area, has a lot to do with the first couple bass that you catch in a day to, day's time. 
And sometimes those bass can lead you to a successful day, and sometimes they can steer you in the wrong direction. So it's uh, just another example why this, uh, this is so such a difficult sport to, to be consistent at on any level. Awesome. Good deal. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, okay, Randy, well, a couple questions here or a couple comments. Um, first up, does all this information apply to lakes up north? Um, that's from Paul. A lot of the information we're talking about, guys, unfortunately, does not apply up north because we don't fish that much up north. Um, it's tough because most of our audience, like 80% of our audience is down south, so we try to focus there. I know there's guys up north that fish. We try to talk about that, but like, it's just it's tough to up fishing up north is completely different i grew up in wisconsin i learned to fish up in wisconsin up north spent literally half my life up there exactly half my life up there and half my life down in in arkansas so i have i have a very strong understanding of how to fish up north because that's literally how i learned to fish and i had to completely relearn how to fish when i moved down south from the ground up completely rethink how i fish because the fish behave so different up there the way they move their behavior everything like that so we might even need to start a new channel, Randy, where we just need to be like, just talking about northern fishing. We could do a whole live stream every single week and a whole new channel just talking about fishing up north versus down south because it's so different. And maybe you yeah. guys would be interested in that, but that's kind of what I find. I love fishing up north. There's no, I mean, I, I, I love fishing for northern smallmouth for fun. I don't like fishing. I fished a ton of tournaments up north in all the Great Lakes, and I can't stand to fish northern tournaments for in a tournament situation because – you can catch 15 or 16 pounds a day and not get a check. And then somebody else catches, uh, you know, a, a pound more than you do. And they finish in the top 20, but I love to fish up North for fun. It's a completely different world. Northern smallmouth are completely different and Northern largemouth than any other fish in the world. And you guys that fish up, you guys that live up North around the border and fish those great lakes, uh, I mean, you guys are spoiled because you got some of the best fishing in the country for sure. Yeah, for sure. That's it's crazy. Guys are saying we should do this experiment video, Randy. Maybe we could put some money on the line or something like that um, to do that tournament too. Maybe get a couple other anglers, a couple of YouTubers in there. I think there it'd be go. fun to get like multiple guys in and like experiment with practice. Like everyone do a little bit different practice strategy and like track it. I don't know who we would find that would do that. I, we need to find some people who would be like willing to do that. Cause the thing is, is that if you're doing that stuff, it's hard to also go actually tournament fish because if you're experimenting with something crazy, it's very easy to suck because you're doing something that's like off the wall and like random. So I, I would rather do it in a lower stress situation than, than a tournament where I'm, but we need to come up with some stakes because like you got to get the blood pumping. You can't just do it for nothing. So maybe let us know in the comments if you have, guys have anything we could fish for, any sort of like anything to raise the stakes a little bit. Like maybe if I win more tournaments than Randy or whatever, he has to get a live scope. I don't know. That could be interesting. Uh, right. Or maybe I have to take the graphs off my boat for a month if if Randy yeah. wins the tournaments. I have to I have to go fishing with no graphs. It, we could do something like that. I think that'd be kind of funny. Yeah, I'll just all you get is a flipping stick and a half ounce jig, and all I get is a football head jig. And see how it goes. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Um, <laughs> Benjamin says I be in. Uh, so that's Ben uh, from Smallmouth Experience. We need to do that. I bet we could do it at different parts of the country too, and like get different YouTubers. Ben, reach out to me. Well, I'll, I'll text you about that. If you have any other YouTubers, we could get maybe like Alex Rudd. We could get a couple other guys in there and, and do some experiments. I think this could be kind of a cool deal, um, and and build out like a, an experiment deal. This could be fun. So okay, let's uh let let's figure it out and we will we will get that tur that data gathering we're going to get this like community data gathering stuff and i'll make the spreadsheets don't worry i'll do all the pivot tables all the v lookups i got you guys on that i just need the data uh, and then i'll crunch it but uh anyways guys that's about it uh one more thing timo's giving me a hard time about the hogs don't want to talk about it just, just don't want to talk about it, you know. Just that's the, the, you know, we're proud of our basketball team. It's been a rough time. Set, as soon as I got into college, guys, freshman year, hogs were great. Then there was a motorcycle accident. Don't want to talk about it. Then went downhill from there. And I just have not had good hogs. So we got base. Our baseball team is awesome. Love the baseball team. We got some other goods. We have to track team. We got stuff. But like my 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 hogs. It's been been kind of rough. My alma mater, Randy. You don't see me wearing the hogs hat that much anymore. I was thinking about pulling out for the stream if we made the uh, if we if we made the final four, but uh, yeah, no hogs hat. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about, Randy, but I'm sure some guys in the stream. Are. You know, I'm sort of a 
sort of a, an outcast because I don't know anything about baseball. I mean, bas- or basketball or football. Like, no, I don't even know who was in the world, the uh, Super Bowl this year. I, I'm just sort of a weirdo when it comes to that. So now you're just sort of talking Greek right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, no worries. Uh, we'll uh, we'll figure that out though. Um, uh, with we need to figure that out with that video. They're saying, Randy, I need a flasher. So I'm getting a flasher if I lose. That's what's happening. You're taking all the electronics on the boat, and I'm fishing with a flasher for a month. There you I, go. That's I'll do good. it. And then yeah. I'm giving you a football jig and a, and a live scope, and you have okay. you can't fish within you can't fish within the cast length of the bank for a month. That's your punishment if you do, if you lose the the tournament. Give me a compass, a paper map, and a flasher. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man! Well, hey, maybe if uh, I need to get some tips from your old co-angler about how to find those gravel bars in the middle of the river, <laughs> talk to David Fritz about triangulation. Give him a call. Hey, how do you line up those trees so well? I don't know yeah. how to do that. Good That's deal, guys. Awesome. Well, uh, excited, uh, guys. Uh, have everyone on the stream tonight. We had a bunch of people on. Really excited about that. Thanks for all the support. If you guys are still here, three hundred people are still here. Leave a like down in the video below. Really, really helps us out with the YouTube algorithm. Also, subscribe. I was looking at my channel the other day. If you guys are fans of Fish the Moment in general, 26% of the people that watch my videos are subscribed to Randy. It's probably similar for yours. For some reason, everyone watches our videos, but they never subscribe. And I am right now at 90, almost 97,000 subscribers on the Fish the Moment channel. If we can get everyone who watches this YouTube video just to go subscribe to the Fish the Moment channel... Just watching this live stream on Fish Moment Live. Go to Fish the Moment, subscribe. I'll hit 100,000 subscribers by the end of the week, and that would be awesome. So um, just call out there. Also head over to Randy's channel, give him some subscriptions as well, and uh, keep growing the the channel and keep doing it. So anything else you got to say, Randy? Yeah, thanks again, guys, for tuning in, man. Really, really appreciate you taking a few minutes or an hour or so out of your evening to check us out, man. Appreciate the support, and hopefully we'll see you guys next Tuesday. Yeah. Thanks again for joining us. Thanks, Randy, for joining as always. And we'll see you guys next Tuesday at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time as always. We'll also see you in our upcoming YouTube videos. Thanks again for checking out the stream. We'll see you all next week.